Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session of the Aspen Security Forum on the U.S.-China relationship. Where do we go from here? I'm Nick Burns, Executive Director of the Aspen Strategy Group. Uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, the Aspen Strategy Group's in its 37th year. We're, um, we have a radical idea, and that is that Republicans, Democrats, and independents can actually work together. We meet several times a year under the auspices of the Aspen Strategy Group to talk about the great issues of our time and foreign and defense policy. Uh, today's discussion includes our moderator, Anya Manuel, Bob Zellick, and Kurt Campbell. But let me tell you something about our Aspen Security Forum uh, three weeks from now, August 4 to 6, before we get to the China discussion. We'll have three days of uh, full foreign and defense policy discussions uh, led by you know, the Australian uh, Prime Minister Scott Morrison, the Indian Foreign Minister Jai Shankar, Greek uh, Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis, Chinese Ambassador Suetong Kai. Our two co-chairs, Condoleezza Rice and Joe Nye, and lots of other people will be speaking. So we hope you'll join us August 4, 5, and 6 for that discussion of America's place in the world. But today, the conversation is on the U.S. and China. And I would just say that um, the questions that come to my mind, Anya and Kurt and Bob, are um, how are we going to compete with China? Because we have to compete with China on the military, political, economic realms. But there's a second question. Can we also cooperate and collaborate with China? Something Bob Zellick's been asking in some of his Wall Street Journal articles. How about on the pandemic or the global economic crisis or on climate change? And question three, can we actually balance the two and find some balance between the necessary competition we have to have with China and the need for us to cooperate as the two leading societies and countries in the world? I think, Anya, that's partially what you're gonna talk about today, but it's a pleasure to welcome you, our, uh, our, our, our director of the Aspen Strategy Group, Anya Manuel. Bob Zellick and Kurt are two of the most serious, smartest and experienced people on this issue and many others. So over to you, Anya. Wonderful, thank you so much, Nick. And those are exactly the issues we're gonna be discussing today. We are very luck lucky to have Bob Zellick and Kurt Campbell with us. They need very little introduction. They're two of America's foremost experts on China. And boy, is there plenty happening in the US-China relationship. So uh, we could go for three hours with this session. Um, Bob Zellick is currently a senior counselor at Brunswick Geopolitical and of course a senior fellow at Belfer at Harvard. He was the president of the World Bank Group from 2007 to 2012, the US Trade Representative from 2001 to 2005, and our Deputy Secretary of State um, from 05 to 06, where I was lucky enough to serve with him. And he serves on multiple board, and very importantly, he has a new book coming out on August 4th called America in the World, A History of US Diplomacy and Foreign Policy. You can all Campbell is currently the chairman and CEO of the Asia Group. He was formerly uh, President Obama's Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific Affairs and has had many other roles at the NSC and at the Defense Department. He also famously co-founded the Center for a New American Security. And now most importantly, both Bob and Kurt are former directors of the Aspen Strategy Group. So thank you both for coming home and doing this with a bunch of old friends. Um, Bob, let me start with you first. Uh, you have been quite courageous in sort of bucking the emerging consensus that seems to be uh, coming out of Washington that China is an enormous threat and this here's how we deal with it. And I thought your Wall Street Journal article recently had a very instructive quote. You said, the proponents of a new Cold War have declared their objections to China. But then you say, when you worked with Secretary of State James Baker in the quote, old Cold War, you focused not on complaining about these countries, but what you wanted to get done, results, not mere expressions of dissatisfaction. So could you give us kind of your introductory views on how you would do things differently? Thanks. Well, thank you, Anya. And, uh... Thanks to, to Nick, and it's always a pleasure to, to be with Kurt. Um, <clears throat> Anya gave us some uh, initial questions uh, also about that I tried to focus a little bit on what we think is going on in China. And I think that's useful because there is a bit of an echo chamber in the United States, as you suggest, Anya, about 
policy towards China. So let, let me just start with, with four quick points. One, uh, President Xi's China. Um, when Xi assumed office in 2007, or, or 2012, he prepared a documentary film about uh, the end of uh, the Cold War. And he directed all the party cadres to view the film. Now, if such a film had been developed in Europe, it would have probably had Gorbachev as the hero that helped end the Cold War. Well, the Chinese version is a little different. Uh, Gorbachev is the man who abandoned the Communist Party, broke up his country, less destruction and ruin, and the not so subtle message is uh, it won't happen here. And I think there's a larger point that Westerners often overlook about China. For us, the fall of the Soviet Union is a historical event. In Beijing, it still casts a long shadow. So I think if Xi had failed to shut down COVID, it would have been a serious challenge to the CCP, the Communist Party's legitimacy. Students of China know that disease, famines, natural disasters are often associated with ends of empire. On the contrary, I think Xi feels he's had relative success, but there's an unstable mixture. He's proud of what he's accomplished, but a little defensive because they know where the virus started. I think there's a sense of hurt. They were somewhat surprised how the rest of the world uh, reacted to their trial and uh, always a danger, a sense of victimization. Second point. Uh, China's approach to the world. Uh, I call it globalization uh, with Chinese characteristics. And it's got two tracks. And this actually comes from a colleague of ours, Evan Feigenbaum. One is to work with the existing international institutions, IMF, World Bank, WTO, uh, WHO, ITU, UN agencies, and to push them more towards Chinese interests uh, and norms. Frankly, this really shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, other countries will try to do the same thing. I think the greater surprise has been that in recent years, we've had a US withdrawal from those institutions and sort of left the field to China. Having recognized this, I think the administration has now pulled out of some, pushed back on others, but it's a rather clumsy process. But then there's track two for China, and that's the Chinese tradition of tributary states. Under this idea, other countries can receive benefits if they pay homage, show respect, certainly no criticism of the emperor or the communist party. Uh, Belt and Road is uh, an example of this with the infrastructure model of development. It also reflects uh, many people in North America overlook for, for China and the region, there's a power of geography and economic gravity that uh, China is using. Yet at the same time, there has been some rethinking in China because of Trump and COVID-19. They had already been moving more towards domestic demand and, uh, and internal supply chains as they developed economically. But there's also been a recent debate on uh, interdependence and vulnerability. It's led to more pressure for self-reliance, which is a traditional Chinese theme. But if you look at Premier Li's closing statement at the end of the, the conferences, it continues to emphasize the outward orientation. He talks about free trade agreements with Korea and Japan. He talks about the RECP, which is the regional tra trade grouping. He talks about Belt and Road, he even makes a nod to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, which the Bush and Obama administrations negotiated and which uh, Trump withdrew, but the other 11 countries have gone forward. At the same time, oh, you see the tension with the bullying. So there's a long list of countries now that <clears throat> China's bullied. I think the most important point, the kind of the base for our discussion is I suspect that China has concluded that regardless of administration, the United States cannot accept China's rise and it will seek uh, to constrain China uh, regardless of administration. And that has some very long-term implications for how we approach this. Third point, and this goes a little bit to one of your points, Anja, um, the US shift towards confrontation uh, has been based in part on a new conventional wisdom that's gone relatively unchallenged. And that is uh, that cooperation with China failed. Uh, now, frankly, that's flat wrong. Uh, I wrote a piece in the National Interest earlier this year that outlines it in detail. But just to give you a brief sense, you know, China was a wartime enemy. It sponsored revolution and chaos. It had proxy wars. Uh, and it's moved from that type of competitor to cooperation on security. It was the world's leading proliferator of nuclear weapons and missiles, and uh, that's uh, a legacy we're still dealing with. 
but starting in actually around 91 and then in the 90s, it started to join the various regimes and has actually been a cooperative part of them. Uh, it cooperated with Iran, our efforts with Iran and North Korea. Since 2000, uh, there have been 190 UN resolutions on sanctions. Um, the Chinese have joined with the United States on 182 of those. Now that's not a straight number because it often required some substantial negotiation and modification. But China's taken on major UN peacekeeping roles uh, on an issue that I dealt with uh, in the mid to early 2000s, Darfur, China actually was quite a cooperative player as Tom Christensen notes in his book. Um, on the economic side, it's provided the greatest contribution to global growth, fastest growing destination for US exports for 15 years until the Trump administration. The current account surplus, which had been about 10%, is down to zero, so all that means added domestic demand. No longer manipulates its exchange rate. In the global financial crisis, Chinese cooperation was excellent with the US and the international financial institutions that had the largest stimulus program. Even on the subject of the WTO, many people are unaware that Chinese commitments were actually far more extensive than those of other developing countries. And they pretty much met their numerical commitments, but the ones that are less easy to measure, such as IPR enforcement, or have been fuzzier. Uh, even in areas like humanitarian assistance, I work with the Mercy Corps. The Mercy Corps has been developing partnerships with China on these issues. On climate change, it's a mixed story. China recognizes the risks of melting in the Himalayas. Uh, it's the major technological innovator for many alternative technologies, but it still has serious investment in coal plants. In the environmental of conservation, uh, conservationists were very pleased with Chinese banning elephant ivory, shark fin soup. Um, but as we've seen uh, with COVID, there's still serious problems of wildlife trafficking. So if we're ever going to get at the biological security area, that would be another important topic. Even in Taiwan, which you had mentioned earlier, Anya, um, you know, if you go back and you look at the discussions that Nixon and Kissinger had some 50 years ago, you might be somewhat surprised where we are today uh, with Taiwan and its uh, autonomous position. Um, in my own experience, I worked with China to get Taiwan into APEC, the WTO, even the WHO assembly. Now, my point through this quick list is not that all is well. We have many, many complaints and all you have to do is read the paper in the morning. But my point is there's really no holiday from diplomacy. And those who see China only as a disruptor are misleading themselves. And frankly, self-deception is very dangerous in diplomacy. So that brings the point that you mentioned, Anya, which is that <clears throat> the real question is, what do we want to achieve and how do we want to, how can we best have those results as opposed to just uh, engage in invective? Finally, uh, my fourth and, and last point, one that builds on a lot of Kurt's work, is I think the US is always most effective if it works with allies and partners. So uh, I could see in the future <clears throat> an effort <clears throat> not only <clears throat> to work with our Asian allies, but importantly with the EU, uh, others in the Indo-Pacific, on common interests with those countries as well as with China. For example, biological security, climate and energy, international economic recovery, uh, frankly, I think you could reach further in the economic area, but the approach would not be the Trump approach, which basically had a buying package that's not being fulfilled. It would focus more on, on the rules for the future. I think the hardest questions going forward will relate to how much technology are we willing to sequester to avoid risks. We already have a splinter net and, uh, and separation in the telecom area. But the question that I would pose would be, whether access to any types of data raises security risks. Because if so, you're gonna prevent co-innovation across many fields, including life sciences. And just look again at the pandemic as an example of the importance of that. <clears throat> or conditions and terms for students and research. So I think for the long term, the United States would be very foolish to cut itself off from the world's talent, including China. I think it'd be very mistaken not to expose China to the United States. <clears throat> and we're kind of in a downward spiral where we cut off things from China, they cut off things from us. I don't think that serves us as an open society. <clears throat> the last thought is, I believe to use your words uh, or Nick's, I think it's possible to compete 
and cooperate while also standing for US American values. This has not been Trump's policy. And of course, it starts with the example we set at home. But with China, I think the mistake is to use values as a club, as an insult, as a way to put China down. Uh, one of Reagan's strengths was he spoke about the aspirations of the Russian people, whether it was freedom and life, religion, uh, openness of society. <clears throat> and every time he did so, it seemed he actually got more response from the Russian people. Our current approach, frankly, will just unite the people in China behind the Communist Party. <clears throat> and my real worry is that the degree of hostility is spiraling out of control even leading to attacks on Asian Americans. <clears throat> Probably all of us know Chinese Americans, people that moved here, become American citizens. And actually some of them are being uh, assaulted with uh, unbelievable ferocity for their views. So <clears throat> I think as we go forward, we kind of have to steady ourselves uh, and understand what we really want to achieve with China. Uh, there's a quality to the bait, which is that the United States has fallen so far behind that we have to almost uh, overreact. Uh, Winston Churchill in 1941, which were pretty dark years, mentioned that we haven't journeyed this far uh, because we were made of sugar candy. And maybe that would apply to us too. Thank you so much for that great kickoff. And I will come back to several of the issues you've touched on. Kurt, I wanna turn to you now. We were half joking right before this session started that in Washington, we're debating absolutely everything, including whether or not to wear masks in a COVID crisis, but we're not really debating the China issue. And I would just add a nuance to that. We seem to have gone from, do we talk about a way to coexist, cooperate in some areas, compete in others versus being tough on China? I think the debate has now moved from hawkish to regime change. When you look at the recent speeches by Robert O'Brien, by Pottinger invoking the May 4th movement, by Christopher Wray basically saying, hey, if you're Americans leaning in favor of China, even then you might be suspicious. Pompeo is gonna give a speech probably next week that will likely be tough. We're moving towards um, what sounds like, although it hasn't been said, a push for regime change. How do you see this and how do you see the lack of debate and what would you do differently? Yes, <clears throat> thank, on, thank you, Anya, and it's great to be uh, with the ASG again, and I want to align myself with many of the views that Bob has just laid out and, and uh, acknowledge uh, his, uh, his courage, frankly, in, in engaging in a very difficult uh, period in the overall debate. What we were saying in advance, Anya, was that um, I, right now, every issue of domestic and foreign policy is being debated just down to the last detail. But on China policy, by far and away, the most consequential issues for the United States over the course of this generation, but generations to come, we are really plummeting uh, uh, and descending uh, down a staircase towards a uh, extraordinarily competitive confrontational uh, set of relations which will have consequences that are very difficult to predict with extraordinarily little discussion about it. Now, I question whether the, um, where the administration uh, rhetorically is going with respect to the idea of regime change. I, I'm not sure that debate has been embraced uh, in uh, America writ large. I think it is still uh, relatively self-contained within the administration. However, the general um, contours of uh, a competitive approach, I think, has taken shape across the political spectrum. And we often talk about how this, in some respects, resembles an earlier Cold War. And I think probably all of us would agree that in, in many important ways, the US-China relationship is so different than the Cold War that, that sometimes using that historical metaphor uh, clouds more than it illuminates. However, I do think there may be uh, a domestic residue of the Cold War that could be animating um, the politics right now. What often happened uh, during the Cold War for decades, is that political parties and individuals would continually try to move to outflank to the right 
um, uh, competitors on issues uh, with respect to the Soviet Union. Normally done by Republicans, but also occasionally done uh, by Democrats with uh, John Kennedy famously moving to the right around Nixon about the missile gap uh, in the 1960s. Uh, I think it's entirely likely that some of that is coming to play inside American domestic politics, and no one wants to find themselves uh, seeming naive or uh, somehow not serious about American purpose when confronted by a leader that appears to be, uh, in Xi Jinping, more prepared uh, to take risks, be certainly more assertive, if not just outright more aggressive across uh, a range of issues. We talked a little bit about this, uh, the South China Sea, Taiwan, obviously Hong Kong, and for me, probably of greatest concern, uh, uh, the uh, uh, engagement across the Indian border. I do want to say one thing, just as you want to start a discussion, Anya. I, I often find myself uh, publicly describing areas of cooperation between the United States and China. But sometimes I'm struck, and I, I know how to make the argument, and I would make the same arguments uh, and declarations that Bob has. But I will also say, having been party to many of those discussions around, around uh, uh, Iran, uh, North Korea, Taiwan, uh, uh, Burma, Myanmar, issues associated with the Pacific, uh, uh, our four deployed engagements, when we have found common ground, it's difficult to really call these cooperative efforts. We occasionally align policies when they are in the best interests of both of our uh, countries. And many of the processes leading up to us working together would, from the Chinese perspective, not be described as cooperative. They're really quite coercive. And we've had to force them in many respects, even on nonproliferation, to take positions that I'm not sure they would have taken without that force and pressure. And so uh, one of the things that I think is going to be challenging going forward is in contrast, ironically, between the United States and the Soviet Union, where we're, there were many areas, despite our lack of commercial and economic engagement, where both sides understood the practicalities of certain kinds of cooperation. I actually think the great irony, despite our connectivity and uh, economic uh, conne uh, connections, there are actually very few habits of cooperation between the United States and China. And so for me, as I come up, uh, Anya, with a to-do list of what to do going forward, one of the suggestions that I would make is in addition to some of the things that Bob is talking about, extraordinarily important with respect to how to think about technology and the like, I would try to find a few things that are extremely unimportant and uh, away from the fire of the relationship and try to establish some work together, uh, whether it's development projects. I did a little bit of this in Papua New Guinea and some places that barely, you know, kind of rise above the ramparts in Southeast Asia, but try to figure out ways that we can actually uh, work together in a more collaborative uh, spirit, which I think is gonna be extraordinarily important going forward. And the last thing is I do think there is a tendency, um, and it's hard, you know, to do a pox on both their houses. Like, yes, of course, that, you know, the, 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 there's similarities between uh, the Trump administration and what might follow. I, I just have to respectfully say, I, I do think we're dealing with something that is completely outside of American experience with respect to the Trump administration. And if you look at the tradition and uh, tendency, there has never been a region where there has been more bipartisanship uh, between traditional Republicans and Democrats in the Asia Pacific region. And we have a, a remarkable amount of things to show for it over the last 70 years. Uh, a engagement strategy, which I agree with Bob, did bear some important fruit, an alliance structure, an open trading agenda, essentially a operating system that served all our interests well. Right now, there are two groups that are working assiduously uh, to undermine elements of that. One is probably not a surprise, China, 
wants to change that uh, elements of it because they are a rising state. Rising states always seek to adjust the existing uh, uh, system in ways that benefit them. We shouldn't be surprised by that. And we have many other allies that prefer the system as it is to help support us. The biggest surprise, and despite it being um, disguised and hidden by certain key players inside the administration, there is no doubt that the biggest element in undermining the American traditional approach to Asia is President Trump. Suspicion of allies, cozying up to North Korea, a bizarre set of policies towards China that cannot be categorized, and a general rejection of the strengths of uh, democracy, human rights, and the like that, have, that has made America strong. And so going forward, I, I, I reject the idea that, you know, that things are going to be the same in some respects if, if we have a different president. No, that is not the case. President Trump in Asia is a profound, deep outlier from a bipartisan tradition that has served our country well for the last 70 years. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kurt. We can all agree that we are in political silly season and we probably won't get much nuance in China policy between now and November. Um, let me take a couple of minutes to dive now into something that I think is under discussed in the United States. We do so much navel gazing about what's our China policy and all the horrible things that the Chinese are supposedly doing, but we don't really spend a lot of time analyzing what Bob Zellick started with, which is what's going on inside China. Are they really 10 feet tall the way we make them out to be? And so, Bob, maybe I'll turn to you on the economic side. You know, you just saw announced today that the Chinese economy grew 3.2% in the second quarter, pretty strong bounce back. At the same time, you've got people in the belt and road looking for a renegotiation of those loans. You're not quite sure where the Chinese economy is going. Could you start with that, please? And then Kurt, just as a preview, I'm gonna ask you um, on the political side, how strong you think she is internally. But Bob, maybe Sure, start. so, um, I, you know, I think one should not underestimate uh, what the Chinese have accomplished uh, in a very short period of time. And one of the things that's always helpful if you're in the United States or Europe is to make sure you stay in touch with some Asian sources because the Asian perspective on uh, China's ongoing changes uh, it give, it makes it when the United States decides to come up with an alliance or coalition policy, I often think that um, some of our diagnoses are the same, but when it comes time for kind of what the prescription is, we're out of touch with the people we need to work with. But I think to come back on the inside of China, I think one of the parts that has been confusing is if you go back to Deng Xiaoping, the reform was linked to an opening up process. And if, if, you, if you read what has come out of China for the past six or seven years, um, the reform, the term reform is used, but it's not uh, in the same opening up model. Um, for Xi, as I was alluding to, the, the number one start is the, the reform of the Communist Party. Um, I got to know him a little bit when he was a provincial party secretary and when I was at the World Bank. And so I actually saw him right after he took office. And it was one of these meetings you didn't have a chance to ask too many questions. But I, having worked a lot on Chinese economic development, I said, what's your number one priority? And he said, the 86.68 million members of the Communist Party. Well, it's now over 90 million. Now, that wasn't the type of answer that most presidents or prime ministers would give on economic development, but it's rather revealing about his priority, which you then saw with the anti-corruption campaign. You, you also saw coming out of, it's quite interesting, a lot of the Americans comment on what China does, but they don't really pay much attention to actually what China says, which is at least useful to, to look at. They're, they focused in recent years on the poorest, uh, the ecological sort of quality of life, um, on administrative performance. And if you look at their most recent Congresses, they've moved from the GDP targets that people always watch, but to a jobs target. And that's in part because they're concerned about the migrant workers and sort of urban white collar uh, service workers. And so um, there are still huge challenges within China. And I think the regime is trying to de-risk some of the most vulnerable sectors. But from the perspective of the U.S. and others in the West, one of the changes are that reform agenda is not the same as opening up competition for foreign firms. 
It's a different agenda. And whether you agree with it or not, it's important to understand what they think are their priorities. Thank you. That's really helpful. Kurt, can I turn to you on the political side? Because of course, Xi Jinping has declared himself leader for life. You saw, I mean, I see being from Silicon Valley, a lot of informal discontent being expressed on the Chinese internet and then shut down also by Chinese CEOs when they're being, when they're off the record and out of the country. There's a lot less of that now because there's been such a big clamp down. Do you see that as a sign of weakness for Xi or does it show that he is strong? Is he really gonna be leader for life? Thanks, Anya. So uh, like Bob, I also had an opportunity to deal with Xi Jinping before he became uh, penultimate leader of China. So uh, when Vice President Biden was uh, the vice president of the United States, uh, he invited President Xi, then Vice President Xi, to come over to engage, to begin a dialogue about the way forward. And I was one of the uh, people that traveled around the United States with him, interacted with him quite a bit, got to see him when to, to a certain extent his guard was down. I, I, I would share one thing that is actually quite similar to Bob's assessment. We, we went through a lot of briefings and, and you, you, know, you watch people during briefings and stuff. I found him remarkably disengaged on economic discussions, not particularly interested in really talking details. Was fascinated by infrastructure, particularly the infrastructure in the United States that didn't work. Um, he was, uh, yeah, he was, he was unsentimental deeply and he believed, uh, he seemed to be a complete, um, uh, a, a complete believer as, as Bob has indicated, uh, very important for him at that juncture to project strength and power personal when, you know, I think the idea to kind of juxtapose his, uh, persona, uh, at the end of their careers, who and when were old men who were infirmed in many respects. He really wanted to project a youthful, vigorous, he would go to the bar at our hotels and stuff, often interact with the team around him, all of whom were extraordinarily anxious to be on best behavior. So, um, you know, a lot of signs of confidence and strength. The irony was he was clearly impatient in a way that you see very infrequently among Chinese leaders and had an enormous amount of confidence in his understanding of, of circumstances, even when he didn't have a full picture of, in fact, what, is, what was being engaged. So it, some interesting uh, dynamics there more generally. When you look at what's been accomplished over the last five or six years, remarkable achievements, both on the economic, the financial side, and on the military side, but one of the most uh, incredible things that doesn't get as much comment is that the previous leaders had taken an enormous amount of time building an intricate uh, set of interlocking institutions that forced Chinese leaders to essentially consult members of the party and the government structures in order to make what they would view is the uh, the the soundest decisions on the most consequential matters. Essentially, Anya, what President Xi has done in remarkable fashion is disassembled basically all remnants of collective leadership. And so in the past, we were able to kind of understand how decisions were taken. I think most of us now believe that the most important decisions are taken by President Xi, perhaps alone, perhaps with the counsel of a very small number of people. And that change, that, that, that change in China is remarkable. Um, people that I really respect in China, uh, uh, you know, uh, McGregor out of Australia, uh, Stape Roy, believe that there are real signs of internal tensions and there are uh, debates about the line and that President Xi cannot act with impunity and that there are lots of groups that are moving, that, that, that have attacked him from the left and also from the right as well. I, I must confess, I see little of that. It feels to me as if uh, uh, true dissent and debate has been profoundly discouraged. I agree with you, uh, Anya, when you talk to Chinese friends, they um, are likely, you know, if they are those that have enjoyed interactions with Washington or uh, having students or children abroad, uh, 
they tend to quietly be concerned about certain aspects of, of President Xi's agenda, of China's agenda. But I will also agree with you. I see less and less discussion of that. I, I will just say I had one friend, I won't go into details who, who I've known for 35 years. And, you know, we often had discussions while we walked along the canal in Beijing or did something together. At one of our last meetings, he said, Kurt, I, I, I cannot talk with you the way we have to have a different, you know, kind of basis for discussions going forward. We can't talk the way we used to talk. And so my judgment would be, first of all, we really cannot know. And that if we were able to see whether she was vulnerable, uh, I, I, I would be shocked by that. Um, and, and, and it appears to me, despite some dissent about the terms of his lifetime employment as general secretary and party leader, I don't think um, it's particularly consequential. And I think he is in quite a strong uh, position going forward. And I believe he has mastered the tools of, um, of uh, statecraft with respect to uh, uh, handling internal uh, dissent, whether it's formal dissent or informal dissent. And I think he is the man that we're going to have to deal with for the uh, uh, period ahead. And that poses some real challenges. Um, it's not clear to me, one of the things that I'll just conclude with this, Anya, that I would have suspected by China, you know, China, like any country, has a playbook. You know, we've seen certain tendencies in China's diplomacy for decades. I would have thought by now that what, which, you know, we all talk, you know, kind of about how China has this long-term plan and they are patient and they know what they're going. That is completely different than my experience of China. China is a deeply impatient country that often oversteps and spends an enormous amount of time then recalibrating. What is surprising about this period is that they've done very little re recalibrating. They have been pushing ahead on many fronts simultaneously in ways that I would have thought both unlikely and unwise. And uh, President Xi has not recalibrated back from that, which there can be a lot of reasons for that, not least of which might be uh, an assessment that the United States doesn't pose the same sort of counterbalance in Asia that we've uh, posed in the past. I agree with you, especially on the, 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 the opportunity for open dialogue with Chinese now almost completely closing. You know, you, you can't have discussions anymore. Um, let me get to China and its region. And then I wanna make sure we leave plenty of time for the audience to ask questions. So just to get everyone ready for that, if you please go um, to the, if you wanna ask a question, if you can go to the participants tab and raise your hand, then I can call on you when we do that. But let me ask two questions about the region. First, of course, front and center is Hong Kong. The national security law was, and Kurt, I think you just said Chinese overreach. They're certainly reaching very, Far. The U.S. has pushed back very hard, very fast with the Hong Kong Autonomy Act, which passed faster than I think anybody thought they would. Um, Trump's executive order, I think from yesterday, revoking Hong Kong's special status. To, to either of you, Bob or Kurt, how much further do you think the U.S. and the world will go to try to push back as takeover, if you will, of Hong Kong? And is there any chance it can succeed? that we push it back? Bob. Um, well, I think just to, to start, it's important to have some sense about what happened here. Um, my own reading of the law is that <laughs> it looks suspicious. Yeah, I mean, you gotta call a spade a spade here. This one looks a little bit like the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe <laughs> in terms of the, the scope of it. Um, and secondly, kind of how it was applied was, was pretty blunt. Uh, and so it didn't give much cover for the uh, Hong Kong authorities to play any role. Um, I expect it will have the uh, success of, of the intended effect of trying to intimidate much of the Hong Kong public. There'll be some resistance, but it's a pretty heavy handed approach. But realistically, and one needs to recognize, you know, Hong Kong has gone through some, some very big turmoils in the past, not only 1949, but, you know, the Cultural Revolution, 1989. Um, and uh, these are survivors, and they will adapt. Now, they're going to adapt, I think, in a different way. Um, I, my own sense is, is that um, 
Hong Kong will increasingly become an entry point to the Greater Bay Area, uh, which is a key part of development. You focused on Silicon Valley, obviously what goes on in Guangdong and, and the South is very critical. And it will still remain a financial entry point uh, into China's markets, which are only partially developed. But I think it will lose some of its international standing and status uh, over time. And you can see the companies that are already sort of adjusting their, their uh, position in it. But frankly, I'm, I'm not sure that these sort of individualized sanctions head us in the right direction. Uh, because going back to something that both you and Kurt mentioned, you know, we're getting into a pattern here where we're going to sort of block Chinese from coming to the United States, we'll block Americans from going to China. I'm not sure that gives us the opportunity. And frankly, as a, as a free society, I've always felt, you know, what do we have to lose by being open to people? Let them sort of see the nature of America. And so the way I would frankly respond is to do two things. One, uh, if we're serious about helping the people of Hong Kong, I'd take the approach that the British have talked about, which is allowing people of Hong Kong to come here, allow it to be sort of an exit valve. That's the greatest deterrent you could have in terms of behavior by the authorities. And then secondly, this is probably the direction we're going, going to your question is, you will gradually withdraw the quality, the economic relationships with Hong Kong that made it different than China. If the Chinese in mainland treat Hong Kong as part of the mainland's economy, well then ultimately legally so should we. But I think the, one of the challenges now we have is this broader one that every time uh, there's something we don't like in China, we try to figure out sort of how to cut something off more. I'd rather look for incentives like creating opportunities for some of those people of Hong Kong to come to the United States and frankly be good for us. Mm -hmm. Good point, thank you. Now, one more question and then we'll go to the audience. Hong Kong is the beginning. Is Taiwan next? And I'll add to that, beyond that, you've seen a lot of Chinese aggression in the region, um, more bullying in the South China Sea in the last couple of months and really importantly, I think, Kurt, you mentioned it earlier, the big flare up in border tensions between China and India, where for the first time since their disastrous war in the 1960s, you've had troops now, we think, on both sides killed. Where does this go? Thanks, Anya. Can I just, uh, I like Bob's point about Hong Kong. It, it's, um, I, I would just say, I, I really don't know where this is heading in Hong Kong. I'm not very optimistic. I think the qualities and character that have distinguished Hong Kong for a century uh, uh, are fundamentally changing now. And I don't think it, there's much that we can do to restore it. And I do think there are th some things that we can do around the edges, but fundamentally, um, uh, I think Bob's suggestion about providing opportunities for Hong Kongers to be able to reside elsewhere are, is a step in the right direction, but fundamentally it doesn't, the, the calculus uh, is being set uh, in boardrooms in which decisions about continuing economic relationships and headquarters in Hong Kong are decided. And I think the trend and tendency, you can see it in almost all discussions, is to try to find another international city in Asia to complement uh, Singapore. And there's a lot of competition for who will take up the slack that's being uh, evacuated with people leaving uh, Hong Kong. And that's a shame and it's a, it's a sad thing and it's hard not to be nostalgia, uh, nostalgic and, and, and worried going forward. Uh, to your larger question, the, 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 the real issue, what, you know, if you look at China in the 1990s, the, 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 the not the genius, but the, the ingenuity of its diplomatic approach is that it had border tensions with every country uh, to its north and to its west, uh, from the former Soviet Union to India and others. And simultaneously over a period of a couple of years, they put all of those on hold or settled because they understood that they needed to focus more on um, sea lines issues, uh, 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 to their east and uh, uh, across uh, uh, the Pacific. And they understood that you wouldn't take on everything simultaneously. What we're seeing right now, Anya, goes again directly against the play, the play uh, 
list the approach that China has taken historically, which is not to handle everything together. What we have is not just what you describe in in Hong Kong and the China and the border area with India, but the South China Sea, the sinking of of fishing vessel, vessels, an extraordinarily unproductive set of diplomatic engagements with Australia, which in the end are going to hurt China in terms of goodwill in a country that had tended to want to have a very good relationship with China, growing anxiety in South Korea and in uh, Japan, and then obviously the Wolf War diplomacy in Europe playing very poorly more generally. So a multi-fronted assault on countries, many of whom wanted a better relationship with China and to try to find some middle ground between uh, uh, overall difficulties with the United States, the more confrontational approach. I don't think that overall is in uh, Chinese best interests. Like Bob, I have a lot of conversations with friends in Taiwan. They report, you know, basically a dramatic ratcheting up of military pressure of, you know, uh, uh, online uh, challenging, uh, constant harassment more generally. And I think they believe that that's going to be the new normal going forward. And Taiwan is going to become increasingly contested space. The challenge, of course, is not only do we have a longstanding relationship uh, with Taiwan, which I would ar argue is profoundly in our best strategic interests, maintaining uh, some elements of that. But at the same time, Taiwan's standing, uh, both in terms of how it's managed its elections, the health of its democracy, and it's one of the countries that has fared the best with respect to the coronavirus, really uh, a uh, case study in effectiveness more generally, and its soft power has never been more important. So I, I, you know, my hope would be over time that China would understand this and would back off, but I see, again, no sign of that, Anya. If anything, a ratcheting up of pressure that I think forces the United States to be clear and unequivocal of our support for uh, deterring uh, 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 violence or uh, uh, steps that could seek to undermine developments in uh, Taiwan. I still think that those are unlikely. I think they'd be so counterproductive to China, but I wouldn't have predicted many of these other steps either. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Just, just real quick. One, um, on the Taiwan issue, I, I think it's Im important for listeners here to recall that uh, the one uh, the one country, two systems policy of Hong Kong was originally designed by Beijing so as to create a pathway for Taiwan. Um, when that is perceived as failing, that will have implications yeah. not only for the Taiwanese, who I think rejected the idea, but for people in Beijing, because I think they can no longer kind of uh, hold forward the idea that one country, two systems will lead a pathway. That creates a much more dangerous environment, as Kurt was suggesting. And this is where, uh, for people like Kurt and others who've looked at uh, some of the defense scenarios, this is not a slam dunk. Um, and people have to realize seriously what one is getting into here. And the reason I mention this is um, the nature of the US debate is kind of, we, we demand everything and every degree of tension you know, we think is gonna uh, hurt China. One of the reasons I make the point about not taking things for granted, the 50 years success with Taiwan, where Taiwan creates a democracy, is a success. We shouldn't be so quick to take it for granted. And if we feel that it's going to be important to defend Taiwan, as long as it doesn't declare independence, as I would believe, then we may have to measure a little bit about what we want in other parts of Chinese policy. Um, but those are the real decisions that people have to make when they move outside of fantasy diplomacy. The other point uh, that, that also Kurt touched on is that I think, I agree with him, that I've been surprised by the degree of Chinese bullying all around. And I think it's a reflection a little bit of the discussion you had with him about the nature of Xi's regime. You know, one of the things in, in our systems, it's a cacophony, we often get upset with each other, but uh, if <laughs> President Trump or uh, President Obama, people are free to criticize it. People aren't free to criticize what's going on uh, in China these days for the reasons you said. And so if you're a rising Chinese official, you might just want to take on the older generation by sounding tougher uh, 
We've got a lot of people in the United States that sound that way. And you can see this, frankly, when the discussion of some of these topics by uh, Chinese Ambassador Tsui, who you'll have at the Security Corps, you can tell he's a little uncomfortable <laughs> with kind of the aggressive policy, or, or it's true with some of the other diplomats. And I think one of the problems is that information is not getting up to G about how these policies are backfiring with them around the world. Now, what saves him is that we've been extremely maladroit in terms of taking advantage of it because we're half in conflict with most of the countries that should be partners as well. But I think that this presents a challenge about the bigger question is that if we don't have discussions with the Chinese, I mean, frankly, I'm sure Kurt had this experience, in private conversations, I could often point out to the Chinese why I thought that their steps were gonna be counterproductive for their own interests. And if you at times can be able to get people to find mutual interests, that's what diplomacy is about. But cutting off ties and making everything a point of conflict will not set priorities and not give us a chance to shape Chinese policy. Right. Well, and if you talk to our own military, all of those painstaking um, de-escalation mechanisms where our navigators were talking to each other, et cetera, they've basically all been shut down by both yeah, sides. Yeah, and the risk of miscalculation, this is the other thing we should not yeah. ignore. We've all seen this. I mean, all it takes... You know, uh, in 2001, we had the EP3 incident with the planes that sort of crashed. And as you probably know, Anya, at that time, you know, the U.S. had a hard time actually ringing the bells in, in Beijing to get sort of the answers on some of these things. These we had things, a track down at a barbecue, right? Yeah, yeah so these things, the, this is where, without trying to say uh, one is soft on topics, I think you could be hard-headed and rational, but focus on uh, not just the job of diplomacy is throwing spears in the air. Absolutely. We've got a lot of questions and very little time, so I apologize in advance. I won't be take, able to take all of them, but let me start with John Podesta. Hi, John. Hey, sorry. I'm just unmuting. Uh, you can hear me? Yes. Thanks, Anya, and uh, good to see you guys. And I thought I'd stay in character and ask you a climate question. Uh, I think from uh, the climate crisis perspective, it would be great uh, to see a lot of innovation happening in China, and uh, particularly on the tech side, 50% of their emissions are coming from the industrial sector. Uh, and, but that smacks up against now what is the bipartisan paranoia about tech dominance in China. Uh, I think uh, Vice President Biden tried to answer the mail in his speech by focusing on innovation by America, that U.S. value chains. But how would you navigate that question? Press them for more investment and innovation on the tech side and energy innovation, or be worried uh, that they can really dominate these technologies, which are critical uh, to getting to uh, decarbonization by mid-century. Not zero by mid-century, as, as yeah. Biden pledged. Go ahead, Bob, I'll, I'll have a second. Okay, well, uh, John, th this is a good example of what I was trying to also make the point in life sciences. Uh, we as a country are gonna have to decide whether uh, we have to quarantine you know, all areas of technology or whether there's some where there's enough commonality of interest. In my view, in the field of alternative energies, uh, there's enough commonality of interest here that I would first start this with my allies and partners. And I, frankly, one of my, suggestions of Biden's elected as he take his domestic agenda and expand it internationally, whether it be this or biological security or sort of his economic opportunity agenda. As you know, from the White House, he's going to have a very full plate domestically. The question is, can he leverage these sort of points internationally? But I would go a step beyond, and you're very familiar with this field, but there's a heck of a lot where China and the United States could share interest in, say, soil carbon, uh, energy efficiency, forestation, avoided deforestation, helping with technology solutions for the developing world. Um, as you know, these framework agreements are based on national action plans and national action plans can be coordinated with one another. So the climate area is to me gonna be one of the tests that Biden's elected, which is that you know if we're gonna be confronting China on everything, then how can you ever deal with climate or pandemics or economic recovery? And I think, that will be a minimum area in which you'll see some exploration, but you'd know that better than I would. So, John, I, I just want to commend you for your uh, focus on this. It is, in, in my view, the most important issue uh, 
Uh, and it's the hardest issue to deal with in the U.S.-China relationship for a whole host of reasons, not simply uh, the issues that you describe with respect to technology. And that any solution or set of solutions associated with dramatically, sharply reducing uh, carbon uh, 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 inputs into the environment are going to re rely on technology. And, and that, I think, is going to be caught up in all the things that we've been uh, uh, describing. The hope is that there is some very high level set of understandings between the two countries that really suggest that this is the existential set of issues that uh, both countries, but not just the United States and China, India and others are confronting. I, I would suggest just a couple of things as we go forward. It's probably the case that, that putting this in a strictly bilateral context uh, is a mistake going, for, going forward. And that I think we have to involve other countries critically in the discussion, and that includes India as well. It's gonna be extremely difficult to put together this you know, geometry, but it's gonna be urgent, number one. Number two, I, I do think, John, one of the challenges that we face with our Chinese friends, and I've seen it again and again, and this gets into this question about habits of cooperation. Uh, we find often on things that are incredibly important, would, we would argue, to the world, Chinese pocket that as something that is important to us and then treat it as a favor that they will do for us, that they will trade off against other things, rather than conceiving it as existential and something that is of profound interest to both countries and to the world as a whole. The hope is going forward that there will be some recognition given the kinds of things that Bob talked about, the rapid melting of the glaciers. Most of the work that's being done in Antarctica and elsewhere has Chinese uh, deep scientific participation. If anyone understands profoundly what we're dealing with in terms of much more urgent timelines, it should be China. And this is nothing to be uh, practicing long-standing uh, tactics of, well, if it's really important to you, what will you trade it for for us going forward? I realize that's extraordinarily difficult. And the thing that I worry about is, as Bob indicated, you know, God, could you have more difficult things on your agenda? The domestic rebirth of the country, issues associated with deep, you know, social unrest and economic uh, set of challenges. And I agree. I like the way the president, the vice president laid this out as a potential economic boon, but the Republicans really haven't gone at that yet, and they will. And so I, I think it's going to be very difficult to marshal the kind of urgency that is demanded if we're going to really avert the worst aspects of the predictions that are not 30 or 40 years away. They're right around the corner. Thanks. Kurt, let me try to get in one more question, and that is from Joe Nye. And while we're waiting for Joe to unmute, um, John Podesta, I would just say one thing. Our uh, tech competition with China, I think, has been drawn far too broad, and we should be cooperating on clean tech, not competing. Mm -hmm. Joe, our chairman, how are you? Hi. Uh, great talks by both of you. I want to try to press Bob to say a little bit about the Chinese economy. Uh, we heard the growth rate today for the second quarter of 3%. Uh, but I wanted to ask, has COVID really changed anything? If you look at the Chinese economy before the COVID episode, there were several major problems it was facing. One was a lower growth rate, uh, which was based on running through the strengths of their old growth model, the export dominated model. Uh, second was the debt problem which seems to have deterred them from the kind of massive infrastructure plans this time that they used in 2008. A third is demography. Their labor force peaked in 2015, and they complain about growing old before they go rich. So if you look at the trend lines before COVID, they were definitely down and dangerous. Uh, has COVID changed anything? Well, what, what I would add, Joe, is, you know, you get a lot of discussion in the United States about the unfairness of state-owned enterprises, and there's a fair argument to be made about uh, the competitive neutrality. But 
as you know, the work from Nick Lardy and others suggests that those are going to be drags on the Chinese economy. And so that's another uh, sort of drain. Um, as, as for um, the Chinese stimulation policies, I think they learned from the huge stimulus they had and the debt buildup. They have done, they have taken steps in terms of credit and liquidity, but they've tried to target it more towards uh, specific sectors. But as, as you alluded to, and as I tried to make the point in one of my answers, um, you, a lot of the unemployment numbers are hid with the rural workforce. Um, they've been able, from what I've seen, uh, to expand some of the industrial capacity, but there's a huge number of white collar workers in the service industries who are gonna be suffering. So this is one of the reasons why, when the talk sometimes is of China being 10 feet tall, you know, I take a slightly different view without underestimating the skill of the technocrats in China and the success that they've had so far. You've also mentioned demographics, which you're quite correct. Uh, that's one reason why China has been more willing to open up in the pension and asset management space because they're going to have to deal with savings uh, for this sort of older generation. And that, by the way, is also the same in areas like intellectual property rights, where China has actually created some pretty reasonable courts that have found for foreigners in most of the cases, but the penalties aren't high enough yet. So it's a good example of when, if you really want to work on the economic openness agenda, you have to drill down in each area and find out where there are sort of commonalities of interest. And from a broader U.S. perspective, uh, I would also suggest that the demographics of North America, including Mexico, look far superior to China, Japan, Europe, uh, and others in the world uh, if we recognize that uh, we need to treat Mexicans as part of a common labor force as opposed to insult them and build walls. So this is part of a point that both Kurt and I have made, which is I think you need to figure out um, how your strategy towards other countries relates to a strategy with China. Thank you so much. We're trying to be respectful of everyone's time. So unfortunately, I have to shut it down there with apologies to all the wonderful old friends who still have their hand raised. We'll give you another opportunity another time. Thank you, Kurt and Bob, for this fantastic discussion. This is really one way to whet your appetite for the Aspen Security Forum coming up from August 4th through the 6th. Uh, we look forward to seeing many of you there, and we're sorry it can't be actually in Aspen, but hope to see you actually in Aspen in 2021. Thank you, and have a great day.